Okay, sir. How how uh, this uh, screen can be shared? Ah, uh, good afternoon, Kalam sir. Yes, sir. How do I sir, uh, do I share sir, my PowerPoint presentation? Sir, ah, uh, uh, below, sir, we have ah uh, ah uh, six icons are there, sir. One arrow is there. We have to click on the arrow, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I can see that. Um, yeah, uh, click on that arrow, sir. And and then I say your entire screen. Ah, uh, entire screen, sir. Okay, exactly. No so I want to share that. that. First, I bring. Now, can you see my screen? Ah, uh, no, sir. Just give me one minute. Then, just a minute. Let me. The. Now, can you see it? Can you see it now? Uh, no, sir. Entire screen, sir. So just uh, you have to click on entire screen. Give me one minute. One minute. One minute. One minute. One minute. Okay, sir. Ah, now we are getting, sir. Just one minute. Now, I just one minute. Let me get my. Yes, sir. Can you see my? Entire... Yes, sir. Already... Sir, now it is visible, sir. Give me one second, please. Yep. Is, is the full screen is visible? Ha, uh, full screen is visible, sir. No problem. Rudra, sir. Ah, uh, sir, can you start? Ha, uh, yes, yes. I will just start. Okay, start. Start. Hmm. Start. Where is it? Start. Is it? Is it? Is it? Is it? Is it? Is it? Kalam sir, uh, yes, sir, yes. Shall we start? Yes, I'm. I'm dying to start. Good afternoon to all dignitaries, guests, delegates, and the participants with great joy and immense ex exultation. I feel privileged to extend my warm welcome to all present here for this online workshop on advanced technologies of electrical and electronics engineering at East 2022. I extremely overwhelmed to get this opportunity to address you all for this online workshop. I welcome our chief guest, Dr. Akhtar Kalam, Professor, Victoria University, Melbourne, Australia. I also welcome all the delegates and participants for joining us today. Your your desire to change must be greater than your desire to remain same. Now I request Dr. D. B. Kulkarni, Professor and Head of Electrical and Electronics Department, to give an introduction about the workshop. Very good afternoon to all. Today is the second day of the workshop uh, titled "Advanced Technologies in Electrical and Electronic Systems," which has started yesterday. So yesterday we have uh, kick-started the workshop, and it is going to be there till Friday. and every day we have got one session each from 3 to 5 so that uh, we have planned it in such a way that uh, most of the delegates will find it convenient daily sparing two hours uh, is better than uh, sparing two full days so in that context we have uh, planned the workshop in such a way that uh, it is only for two hours on daily basis so yesterday we had a session from dr bikash pal of imperial college london and today we have with us online dr akhtar kalam so dr kalam is with victoria university melbourne since 1984 he has wide experience in educational institution and industry across all the four continents he has been recognized internationally for his research so detailed introduction about the speaker would be rendered by one of my faculty colleague later I welcome Dr. Kalam for today's session on electric vehicle. So I thank Dr. Kalam for accepting our invite to deliver a talk. In spite of his busy schedule, he has spared time for us, and he is available with us. So I am sure that today's session will be definitely uh, helpful for all our delegates, our faculty colleagues, and uh, all the research students also. And I would like to inform Dr. Kalam. that uh, in our uh, institute our department electrical and electronics engineering is a very vibrant department and uh, we have recently started the uh, laboratory in electric vehicle and energy lab 
similarly we have started uh, one uh, lab on uh, programmable logic control and some industry institute uh, connect also we have established for for the uh, programmable logic control laboratory as well as we have recently established one uh, ac charging station for uh, our campus in the campus and uh, we have given free charging uh, facility for our faculty as well as the students so we have got one area which we have uh, reserved for this charging station uh, and on those basis again we are conducting various competitions uh, and design competitions for electric vehicle and so on uh, and uh, recently last year we had uh, announced one design competition from uh, the students of our institute and the students were from all the different wings that is mechanical electrical electronics and so on and we had uh, uh, say uh, given them some problem for calculating or say for designing that uh, electric vehicle it is a three wheeler uh, vehicle design and the students have given very good response and uh, we are going to give the prizes to the uh, uh, winners uh, in the couple of days in the next couple of days and uh, uh, according to the first design first winner design we are going to fabricate the model of the electric vehicle so that is also in process so this is one uh, good uh, say thing what i would like to inform our uh, today's speaker that we are uh, uh, trying to uh, do best in the area of electric vehicle and the other related uh, technology so i once again welcome dr kalam for today's session i also welcome all my faculty colleagues students research scholars and other delegates who have registered from outside uh, uh, our college as well as outside uh, india also some of the uh, delegates are there i welcome all of them today and uh, i am sure that the session will be very useful to all of us and uh, i i uh, hand over the uh, platform to uh, our anchor thank you thank you sir for briefing us about the workshop The most important step that will add a bonus to any function is introducing the chief guest in person. May I now request Professor Vinay J Shetty to introduce our chief guest. Uh, hello, good afternoon to one and all. I hope I am audible. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce today's speaker, Professor Athar Kalam. He has been at Victoria University Melbourne since 1984 and a former deputy dean of the Faculty of Health Engineering and Science and head of the engineering of the College of Engineering and Science he is currently the head of the external engagement at the College of Engineering and Science Victoria University he is also the current chair of the academic board in the Engineering Institute of Technology Perth Australia and interim chair of the academic board taxilia college of australia melbourne in addition he is the editor in chief of australian journal of electrical and electronics engineering further he has a distinguished professorship position at the university of south, new south wales sydney australia mrs punjab technical university bhatinda india crescent university chennai india VIT Vellore and Chennai campus India one Omani un institution and five Malaysian universities he also has a wide experience in educational institutions and industry across four continents he received his BSc and BSc engineering from Calcutta University and Aligarh Mus Muslim University India he completed his MS and PhD at the University of Oklahoma USA and the University of Bath UK He has worked with Ingersoll Rand and other electrical manufacturers. He has held teaching appointments at the University of Technology, Baghdad, Iran, sorry Iraq, and Capricornia Institute of Advanced Education, Rockhampton, Queensland. He has been recognized internationally and nationally for his research. He is the first person to have received the John Madison Mandel uh, Medal from Engineers Australia. in consecutive years 2016 2019 and 2020 the john madison medal is awarded for the best paper in australia written by a current member of engineers 
Australia and published in the Australian Journal of Electrical and Electronics Engineering. His outstanding impact has most recently been highlighted by his prestigious ACPE CIGRE Outstanding Academic Award 2021. The award recognizes an exceptional Australian academic for outstanding career, long contributions to industry, teaching and research in electrical power engineering. He is regularly invited to deliver lectures, work on industrial projects and examine external thesis overseas. His major area of research interests are power system analysis, communication, control, protection, renewable energy, smart grid, IEC 61850, implementation and co-generation systems. He has been actively engaged in the teaching of energy systems to undergraduates, postgraduates and providing professional courses to the industry both in Australia and overseas. He regularly offers continuing professional development and master class course on power system protection, renewable energy, IEC 61850 standards, co-generation and gas turbine operation and PBL in engineering education to practicing engineers. The Energy Supply Association of Australia known as ESAA, Instructor Development Course IDC Technologies and Australian Power Institute API. Okay. He also runs postgraduate distance education program on power system protection for ESAA. He has conducted research, provided industrial consultancy, published over 600 publications on his area of expertise and written over 29 books in the area. More than 48 higher degree research students have graduated under his supervision and he is an external examiner of many external doctorate students in Australia and overseas. He provides consultancy for major electrical utilities, manufacturers and other industry bodies in the field of his expertise. Professor Kalam is a registered professional engineer in the state of Victoria, fellow of EA, IET, AIE, a life senior member of IEEE, NER, APEC Engineering, INTPE Australia and a member of CIGRE APB5 study committee. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir, for introducing our chief guest. I hope that today inspires ideas and discussion around the way that we can make our city a better place. We are pleased to have Dr. Akhtar Kalam with us and he will enlighten us more about the subjects with their thoughts. Over to you, sir. First of all, thank you very much, MC, for your kind introduction and in particular, Dr. Kulkarni for the invitation uh, to join you in your workshop. Um, I was very pleased that I was talking to uh, a college which is affiliated with VTU. Uh, which was Rea Technological University, because I correct a lot of theses from VTU. As a matter of fact, now I'm correcting a thesis of VTU as as I'm talking to you. So so uh, so I'm very well established with VTU. I do a lot of work with VTU, uh, and I'm so glad that you are affiliated to that in institution. And I want to see um, uh, one of the next uh, PhD thesis coming from VTU will be on electric vehicle. Uh, and with all the lab facilities that you've got, I wish you all the best. And I think uh, you're one of the rare universities or institute in, in, in India in particular, and, and maybe in Southeast Asia, who actually have got a devoted lab and facilities of electric vehicles and, and charging environment. That is a fantastic thing. And I congratulate Dr. Kulkarni and all the people in the electrical and electronic engineering at uh, GIT. Uh, with that uh, few words, I would like to mention that um, whether you like it or not, electric vehicle is our future. Electric vehicle will be there everywhere. Now, how you're going to use it? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? And I'll tell you there are a lot of opportunities. There's no doubt about it that uh, the grid will be put into a uh, lot of extra drive and overdrive and, and that, that will definitely happen whether we like it or not. But that is the challenge that the grid has to take care of. The other thing is that um, with the privatization of electricity supply industry, uh, where the load um, 
uh, has been remarkably reduced because pe people have got their, their own, own um, little generation system, which is in the form of a, a PV or batteries on, on the top of their roof or houses. Um, the, the challenge will be that uh, with electric vehicle coming uh, is that um, will the load increase dramatically to make sure that the, uh, the new electrical, electricity supply industry will have enough power to give to the people. So with that uh, few inter a small introduction, I will start with my actual presentation. First of all, Dr. Kulkarni, can you all hear me properly? Can you see my slides? Yes, yes sir. sir. We are able to hear you. OK, thank you very much. And you can see my slide, isn't it? Yes, sir. OK, sir, now, sir, one, one small request. my presentation, sir, I would like to be Sir, sir, sir yes. one small request. Uh, if you can just put only one slide so that we can see it in a bigger uh, font size. Sorry, I, I thought I, I asked you that question. Give me one second. Yes. I'll just swap it. Now is it one, one slide? Ah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And now it is fine. Uh, sorry, sorry. I, 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 I swapped it. I thought um, uh, the last person said that this is two slides, so I made it into one slide. No worries. Yes, yes, thank sir. you very much. Yes, now sir. you can thank see you. one slide, isn't it? Yes, sir. Good, good. Now, what is the purpose of my presentation? I will give you introduction, uh, factors which is affecting the uptake of electric vehicles uh, and how the adoption will take place. Especially, um, are we going to see widespread adoption? What is that impact on electricity sector? What impact will that have on electricity sector? That's a million dollar question. Uh, then what the industry response is and, and, and look at potential uh, and especially V2G, which is vehicle to grid. Uh, can I uh, come with my vehicle to uh, uh, KGIT and, and run my electrical lab through my electric vehicle? And is that possible or not? Can I do that or not? Uh, because I'll have a fully charged car and can I run my renewable energy lab from there, the power system lab from there? So this is a challenge that I'm throwing right in the beginning. And what are the Australian in initiative and what is happening in India also with electric vehicle? I must admit, India is, um, uh, is, is doing very well with, uh, with, uh, with vehicles, with transportation, uh, especially the IC engine type. And, and I'm sure that they will come in a big leap and bound in electric vehicles in in few years to come so i'll be i'll be giving you some some conclusion on that too but uh, i don't know whether i'll be able to finish all this in two hours time that i've been allocated but i'll try and do as much as possible what i can't do i might skip a few slides uh, but um, the first uh, few slides are basically um, talking about the various vehicles which are there in the market and i might go a bit faster in that section Now, uh, coming to the uh, electric vehicle, and, and what does this mean to the electricity sector? And so what I'm going to say is that um, what, what we are going to see is that there is going to be shift from petrol to electricity. So in the past, we used to put petrol in that tank. Now we are going to use electricity. Naturally, this becomes a big electric load. Now the question is that, is that a help or is it a hindrance? And that's the first question I would like to stress on. Is this a help or hindrance? According to me, it's a great help. If electric vehicle does not come, and if the electricity supply industry is 100% privatized, I think half of the electricity distribution companies will die because there won't be any uh, enough load to be taken and and we will have see lot, lot of reduction in our workforce so it's a great help that electric vehicles coming to the market will make sure that electricity sector survives and will thrive with this uh, sector naturally there will be challenges so i want to see what does this mean this thing this new load which we have got what does this mean to the sector itself? 
Now, I, I want to mention a bit on in, in Australia. Just to give you an example, in Australia, there are 24 million people and there are 17 million vehicles. And, and this is a fact. Uh, we've got, uh, our, we have practically every house to every one person, there is 75% pop, 75% vehicle. That means every three person are sharing two vehicles. If there is three people family, you will find that every 1.3 person has access to a vehicle. So this is this is part of our life. And, and, and we do travel a lot in Australia. Uh, it's a huge country. And, and we do have a lot of usage of electric cars, sorry, of vehicles, of transportation, of uh, not only the, I'm not talking about uh, the commercial type of vehicle. I'm also talking about the vehicle which we have in our residence. So the passenger vehicle, normally, we, there are 76% of this 17 million vehicle are the passenger vehicle. And they travel between 12 to 14 kilometers per day. Then there are 15% uh, is light commercial vehicle, and the rest of them are trucks, buses, and other things. The fuel efficiency is about 19 units per 100 kilometers. So this will add 8% to our annual energy consumption. So the electricity consumption will definitely increase by 8%. So you see, that is the help to the electricity sector. Then comes the next thing. We are used to this, isn't it? In our normal car that we have, the conventional car that we have, by conventional car, I meant the IC engine type, we normally fill the car. And normally, we would put up 40 liters in two minutes. And that's about 12 megawatts are put in two minutes. And this is the challenge. This is the real challenge. Can I charge my car in such a way that it takes place of 40 liters of vehicle of petrol? And that has to be done. Look at the time in two minutes. The customer does not have that much time to wait for half a day to charge its electric vehicle. So that is something which is a huge challenge. So charging infrastructure is a huge challenge. And I'm so glad to see that KGIT is working on that. Then in Australia, we are doing a lot of studies on EV. Uh, like, uh, and, and there is a, a paper from our, uh, uh, the electricity, Australian Electricity Commission, which talks about uh, what are the impacts going to be on natural gas vehicle on electric vehicle how will it impact the electricity sector how many electric vehicles we will have and i'll talk about that also then the type of vehicle i want to emphasize on four types of vehicle one is what i call ice ice is the conventional vehicle that i was talking to you about which is the internal combustion engine then the other one which is the bev which is the battery electric vehicle and the Third one is PHEV, which is the plug in hybrid electric vehicle and the hybrid electric vehicles, right? So these are the, the four types of vehicle that we will be talking about. And now let us go and see what are the factors which are affecting the choice of the vehicle. And let us see what are the effects on the uptake of EV. Now, when you are trying to purchase an electric vehicle, you'll be looking at the following thing. The first thing you want to see is what is the vehicle price? Is the price absolutely offensive? Or is it the comparative to your today's car? And naturally, the first thing that comes in everyone's mind is the price of battery. Because in the past, the battery price was the one which was a big factor. And I'll talk to you about that later on. Then comes the global supply constraint. You hear that there are so many shortfalls because of, of uh, 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 fossil fuels and, and impact on of petrol and diesel. So all that which is coming from global, there is constraint in our energy 
um, supply. Then the prices. Remember, a customer is going to compare the petrol versus electric price. Is it costing us more or less? And I will also give you an indication of that. Then what is the range of the vehicle? How many kilometers that that vehicle goes? Can it go 50 kilometers? Can it go 400 kilometers? That is also a decision that will be required by the customer wants to know that. Then the other thing is that, do we have a charging infrastructure? In KGIT, you've got one charging station. Now, it's all right, you charge your car in, 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 um, in uh, KGIT, but can you go from uh, Belagavi to Hyderabad or Belagavi to Chennai on one charge? Is there enough charging infrastructure between Belagavi and Ch Chennai, between Belagavi and, and uh, say Mumbai? Belagavi and Delhi or whatever it is, are there any charging infrastructure? If there's no charging infrastructure in that, that 200, 300, 500, 1000 kilometers, then no one is going to buy the car. They don't have, if there is no charging infrastructure. And the most important thing is the green credentials. And this is something which I would like to talk about a bit more later on. Now, let us talk about which are the top five countries with electric vehicles. And you guys, the best country for electric vehicle is the European Union, then UK, California, China. So you see that these are the five countries. One, two, three, four, five. These are the five things which are the top five. And an average is around that much, right? And and this is the, the 2021, the blue is 2021. Let's take only the 2021 figures. See how the figure is for uh, Norway to European Union, from European Union to UK and California and China. So the average is somewhere around here. In Australia, look at that. We are very much behind and we don't like that. We thought that we will get more into electric vehicle. Now, I, I, I went to the uh, market uh, when I was asked to give this presentation to find out how many electric vehicles were sold in 2021. In the first half of the year, we had about 8,700 electric vehicles which were sold. And out of that 8,700 electric vehicles, there were 31 electric vehicles which were, the models had 31 models were there. In 2020, 0.78% of all vehicles sold in Australia were electrical. Now, if you compare that with the UK, can you see we are so much behind to the Britishers? And look at how much behind we are with Norway. And the other thing is that out of these 31 vehicles, 14 electric vehicles are priced under $65,000. That's a very important figure that you should remember. Now, as I mentioned, look at the charging instruction. Now we have 3000 public chargers, 470 of them are DC fast chargers. And there are 58 electric vehicles in the Australian market that is coming. Remember, I talked to you about 31 in 2021, another 27 will, 17 will be added 27 will be added by 2022. So we are going to double the choice for our customers. Then uh, if you look carefully, 51% of them are, are we, we did the opinion poll of, of those who are buying and, and they said that they want to buy something new. Uh, then they want to see something which is electric vehicle. Some of them said that we don't want to consider. But you will find more than 50% of the people were interested in buying electric vehicle compared with the others 49% who were thinking about it or were not sure. Now we asked the question, why do you want to go for electric vehicle? 43% wanted to go for electric vehicle because of environmentally environmental reasons. 
they want emissions to reduce they do not want your ic engine the one with petrol and diesel to be running plying in the street of of uh, belgavi or wherever it is they think that it is an environmental hazard therefore 43% thought that electric vehicle will solve that problem um 22% did not see there was any benefit 17% were fed up with the price of petrol and diesel you know better than me and i don't want to be a politician i am not a politician but i do know in modi's government today you are paying between 100 to 110 rupees per liter of petrol which is more than twice the price that i am paying at melbourne so that is a subtle difference that is a reality my friend you are paying for petrol 22 times more than what i am paying so people are fed up paying that 100 to 110 rupees per liter for diesel and and petrol in india so so in australia also we are fed up of paying 50 to 60 cents a liter and and now we are traveling to 1 dollar 40 cents 1 dollar 50 cents a liter so that three times increase although it is half the price of what is in india but still we are not very happy about many of people are concerned with health and they, that's why they wanted electric vehicle and and um, uh, others uh, 7% thought it was economically good decision because they think that the domestic industry and jobs will grow so that was the choice now i'm going to introduce a term called prosumers now this is a very interesting term that i've i've coined prosumers means you are a producer and a consumer so producer the first three letter of producer consumer the first three letters of consumer so that's a new word called prosumer so you're no longer a consumer you are prosumer you have got pv panels on the top of your roof any excess you are selling it back to the grid i hope okay or you are selling it to your neighbor where are you you doing right and so we are now prosumers and there are solar panels and battery storage in every houses in melbourne that i know of okay uh therefore uh you will find that 55% solar panels and battery storage are there 15% are purchased from grid 13% they are not bothered where the electricity comes from 12% are using green power and 5% are not sure where they're getting power from so you will find majority of our consumers are no longer consumers they are prosumers and either they are buying it directly from the grid or they're selling it back to the grid now what is the constraint why we do not have this electric vehicle which i if i would have given this lecture about 5 years back i would have said that by 2020 we would have about 10 to 20% of our vehicle should be electric and we have less than 1% of our vehicle is electric and the reason is that we do not have enough electric vehicle coming although we hear that large numbers of electric vehicles are available or they are planned imminently as i told you we had 31 choices now we have get 58 choices from in the australian market in 2022 okay one of the factor is the supply uh we are not getting enough supply and that could be a very significant factor uh, which is limiting the growth of electric vehicle in australia now look at newspapers newspapers are shouting they are saying that australia risk being left behind in petrol fuel parallel world as other countries embraced electric cars our newspapers is saying how green are the electric cars our newspapers are saying australia's electric vehicle policy steers us to a future based on fossil fuel it needs to be dumped just like in india in australia we have our prime minister who is very much in favor of fossil fuel plant not a very big supporter of renewable energy and and the and the public is not happy about this they want to go to renewables now let us see some of the models and i'll go very quickly to that first 
This is a Mitsubishi one, little tiny little car. I don't think this will be very popular in Australia. The reason is that we don't drive small cars in Australia. Although this has got a, a 90 to 150 kilometers type of range. I, this reminds me more like Maruti, when Maruti started in India. Uh, and it's available now at $48,000. And, um, uh, you know, you can pay it back in 43 years time. I think that uh, uh, if I sit in that car, I will be very disappointed. I will not be happy with that car at all. If this is a battery electric vehicle. Now, the Nissan Leaf, this is a very common one. And look at that price, it's a good range between 100 to 160 kilometers. And this is the normal sedan, okay? This has printed performance. Now be very careful, I'm talking about this and I will be talking again this also in few minutes time. That Nissan Leaf, although it's very nicely priced, but environment, it is not very good. The Holden Volt, this is, this is the classical car which is very similar to its size in ICE, which is the internal combustion engine. This is a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. Look at the range. Range is not very ha happy. We are not very happy with 60 kilometer range. You know, the price is $60,000. But I can get this type of car in petrol at one third the price. I can get that in $20,000. So this car, although it's a good thing, but may not be very good from the market point of view. Okay, after that is, is Renault. This is a French one. Again, this is a battery one. Okay, you can swap the battery in four minutes. It has a good range, 185 kilometers. And it's a good range also, and the price is not bad. And this is, feels like a real car. I mean, this is, this is what I call a real car. Okay, uh, and the price is very affordable. So it, this is very similar to a car that I would like to have with my price, with range that I work with. Now after that is um, after that is um, just a minute. After that is, is Tesla. Ah, this is one I love. I love this Tesla Roadster, but I can't afford it. Look at the range. 394 kilometers. It is available. It's available in Australia market. But can I afford it? $200,000. I can get a second hand for $100,000. But this is a real car. This is this is one of the electric cars that I think uh, will become. Tesla models will become very popular. This is a cheaper brand, the Model S of Tesla. Now look at that range, 500 kilometer range. And it, it has been available from 2014. Look at the price compared to 200,000. This is 60 to 100,000 dollars, depending on the size of the battery. And in, in the United States, in California in particular, this car, this Model S of Tesla, is outselling Porsche and Audi. Then comes the Model X. This is a SUV, uh, which is um, uh, basically a sport utility vehicle. Very nice. Look at the way how, how the doors open, right? This is a 500 kilometer range. Again, uh, this is slightly more than Model S, so slightly more than sixty to $100,000. Now, I can tell you, Tesla is now working. And, and within the next three to five years, they're working on cars, and they will be introducing cars with $30,000. They've already done merger with Apple. They have got supercharger stations. 14 of them are in Europe. In Germany, there are in autobahns. Uh, half of Germany has already got uh, a super charging station, and you can charge for 30 minutes every few hours. Now, uh, the example of China. One of the reasons China went to electric vehicle is to is to resolve the air pollution issue, and I'll be talking about that also later on in my presentation. But one thing Chinese government has done, they have switched to e-mobility. So they believe very much in e-bikes, e-cars, e-buses, etc. And, and they are lo looking at mass production. And I can tell you that uh, I read the other day in Sydney, China is going to market its first electric vehicle. And you know, the price is less than $20,000. So 
they are going to be a significant factor in Australia with those type of models that they are planning to float in Australia. Now let us see the supply constraint and vehicle price. So um, I can tell you right now, everyone will say that upfront the prices are expensive. Okay, compared to ICE, you are paying a premium of twenty-one to fifty thousand uh, dollars, and um, it's a premium to purchase in Australia uh, versus internationally. You may get it cheaper internationally because in Australia there are taxes that might increase the prices. But okay, I agree that there is a premium, right? But if you look at the present car that you have, and if you have you have got a petrol at one dollar fifty, which uh, literally is, is what I I took it as granted. Uh, that is the Australian price. In in if I wanted to put it in India's context, it'll be more than two dollars per liter. Anyway, if you drive a use seven point five liters for hundred kilometers, for every hundred kilometers. It is costing you eleven dollars twenty-five cents. If it's an electric vehicle and you are getting electricity at on-peak price at thirty cents per unit, and as I told you, to drive hundred kilometers you need nineteen units, so it's going to cost you five dollars seventy. Look, it is half the price of that. Or if you are doing it at off-peak price, it'll be one fourth the price. So it's twenty-five percent of the price in off-peak charging. So can you see that how much cheaper it is to run an electric vehicle, although the upfront price is more. Now the fuel price. Now uh, naturally, if you are looking at carbon price, that favors uh, the internal combustion engine vehicles, ICE engines. Okay, but if you look at electricity prices. Where there is strong growth, low pollution is what pe people are talking about. And when we did the modeling, we can see that uh, uh, it, look at the at the way the prices are keep on increasing, it's escalating. Okay, whether it is you're taking global action, you're using clean energy, or whether you're using high price scenario. This is the high price scenario, and this is the global action. So if you look at that, the prices. Of electricity is in on the rise. Now the life cycle cost, and I'm comparing the ICE to hybrid to plug-in hybrid to battery to the natural gas. And if you if you are looking at a low kilometer small car, if you look at the small car, this is your gas price. You know the LNG, the LPG that you think is very good, which is horrible. I must tell you. Uh, this is the price. This is how the life cycle price is, and it's a small car. Okay, whereas in high kilometer, although it's a small car with high kilometers, if you are using uh, the LPG and LNG, look at the price. The price is increasing. So in fact, the only thing which is decreasing is your battery electric vehicle, whether it's a low one or the high kilometer one of a small car. So you will find compared to Everything, in particular ice and the natural gas, which we think is cheap, I believe that electric cars is much cheaper and a better proposition. Then the range. This is this is something that people are worried about because everyone is interested in knowing the range. Uh, naturally, uh, the best range I can think is Tesla Roadster. And you know that it's two hundred thousand dollars. You can't afford it, but but that's the best range. But if you look at it carefully, majority of the cars that I can show you are between eighty to one hundred sixty kilometers per day. So which is enough? I told you in Australia we drive about twenty kilometers a day, so which is more than enough uh, for majority of our trips. So there is uh, we need to have public awareness campaigns. And and once the people are aware of this, that it, it drive up to eighty to one hundred and sixty kilometers, then there should be no problem. Then the typical vehicle type. Is there some problem, Doctor Kulkarni? Should I stop? Hello. 
ah yes sir hello uh, is yes, there a problem if everything is okay okay sir yeah, good i thought i was not audible i i could hear noise now if you look at 72000 trips over one year and look at that half of our trips are less than 5 kilometers and 90% of our trips are less than 30 kilometers and more than 99% of the trips are less than 120 kilometers and you i told you the range is up to 160 kilometers so this is well within the range of of an electric vehicle then the charging infrastructure there are three types of charging infrastructure and i'm sure you know about this there's one which is because you have a lab on this there could be a level 1 which is the standard level 2 which is the fast and level 3 which is the rapid charge the rapid charge takes only few minutes the standard one the fast one takes 30 minutes and the standard charge that you may use at home is initially 6 to 8 hours but the top is only top up is only 2 to 3 minutes 2 to 2 3 hours whereas um, uh, the fast charge the total charge is normally you will never do a total charge you only do top up the first time you do a total charge and all the time you are doing a top up so both the standard and the fast one are sufficient to use at home or commercial premises and any public charging facilities like what you have got in git the rapid charge uh, will be something that is only to dedicated places and and i'll give you some of the examples and i'm sure you've got similar thing uh, uh, and and in particular i can look at home charging uh, this very similar similar type of setup this is your 10 amp plug this is how the plug will be slightly different can you see the plug will be the the gpo will be 15 amps and any electrician can install it a uh, level 2 electrician can also install a second meter the cost will depend on the site most providers of ev charging infrastructure the the two good ones that i know of is called better place or charge point the better place i've got them in bolard or wall mounted or domestic one where the charge point has got exactly the same they've got bolard wall mount and domestic but they also have a new one which is the pole mounted one now um the the cost of these because people say that what is the cost of this if you are using the level 1 the this is the product that is there okay the unit price is $3000 right whereas level 2 one $3860 for outdoor it is 3000 and 6350 so the level 2 one is is expensive outdoor and and then the the installation charge is $600 to uh, $1200 for a domestic garage and for commercial car park is up to $2500 naturally if you want to put it on 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 the street bullard it'll cost you about $10000 now the greenhouse gas emission um average electric vehicle has lower emission than average ic at present look at look at the emission although the emissions are reducing i know that right but that is how the emission is look at the emission from the electric vehicle compare this one to that one you can see there's much lower emission from the electric vehicle and you can use 100% green power now uh, the individual vehicles can vary you remember i was talking about nissan leaf which is costing $30000 and this mitsubishi which is costing Forty-eight thousand dollars. This is this is the the difference. The pollution from the Nissan is much greater than that from Mitsubishi. It should have been to compare with the Holden and the Audi. It should have been in that region between the two dotted lines. So although this is not as good as walking, cycling, and public transport, uh, but EV do not address. Uh, traffic congestion parking issues and have embodied energy in the battery and car components but you know i mean th this is th you can see this site very commonly in china now uh, you will also see 
that uh, all our transport system india has got the largest network railway network in the world and uh, you will see new type of transport systems which will allow how you to carry your your electric vehicle in the train so uh, this will be uh, a autonomous vehicle which will be going on the road you can use it an alternative to private car ownership battery electric vehicle are already outperforming ic in high use application i know in australia all our posties the australia post uh, uh, letters they all use battery electric vehicle uh, they are using motor scooters which is running by battery electric vehicle so you will also see these type of of uh, buses and ferries which will be having rapid charging station just like they will come over here just like uh, your trams that you have there will be catenary charging on main routes uh, this will have different impacts on the grid and there will be in opportunities for control charging now we also did the forecast and the forecast um, is such that um, uh i can tell you right now that um, it is inevitable whether we like it or not and and i'll just take some of the figures uh, this blue thing that i've got is hybrid the green is plug in hybrid and the golden color is battery i can tell you right now is that i don't know when the ev in take update take place completely but i can tell you this will definitely happen and you will see that uh, uh, which you saw in 2015 and 2020 compared to that there be lot more battery charge the 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 hybrid one will reduce dramatically and the plug in hybrid one will be saved after that um, let us look at um, at factors which are influencing the impact on electricity sector and and this will be the uptake of hybrid um because uh, and this will limit the impact because people would like to go to hybrid first i still remember um in um, about 10 years back when i had my petrol car i converted it to run with petrol as well as with gas right so there will be the same sort of option will come that people will be will be using electric as well as 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 the petrol car so hybrid will then definitely be there in the first few years then the size of the vehicle um naturally initially people will be looking at small vehicles right then there will be special clusters uh, and these are basically the behavior of the urban users the future such as charging demand high energy consumption area and highly travel parts are all captured and the earlier adopter com communities will be looking at spatial clusters and the management incentives the charge which will dictate what will be the network impact now now look at the maximum load in 2010 and and look at it at different parts of the country uh, i've got uh, three five of the states ACT New South Wales Victoria South Australia and Queensland uh, it it varied between 4:30 in the evening to about 6:30 in the in the evening so the loads are different right and this is the maximum load and when the load comes down to the night time or then in this time this is when you have enough opportunity to charge your electric vehicle so you will have additional demands my friends you will have additional demands and um, uh, this part shows that this there will be increment that will be the unmanaged one that will be the one which will be come coming from electric vehicle can you see that and uh, so that will be the one uh, and and if you look carefully in the year 2030 i'm looking at right i have got 8600 can you see that in that year in the central thing i've got 8600 additional megawatt will be required uh, for for time of usage charge is only 410 megawatt and for smart charging i'll have another 205 megawatt but i will need that sort of extra extra sort of capacity after that if you look for additional peak demand again uh, again if you look at it 
uh, you need that extra. This is because of the electric vehicle. Okay, this is your forecast. Uh, but uh, this is the statement of opportunities in Australia, and uh, this is the extra bit that you need. So you can see that um, we will have to come up with extra type of of money per electric vehicle. And that has to be shared between generation, transmission, and distribution. And two thirds will be taken by the distribution sector because that $10,000 has to be shared between those three things. And the young people, especially the early adopters, clusters, they are the one who will take the new technology. And they will be the one who are having higher average income. Their level of education is higher. They have got above average technological skills and they are aware of environmental impact and they want new technology. Look at that. They will be the one who will be taking up first all the, uh, uh, the electric vehicle. And as I was talking about the spatial clusters, you will see that this is, this is the cluster that will take up the, look at that. That is Melbourne, that black stop. This is New South Wales. In Sydney, challenges that I will have, and those additional challenges is that level two charges. If I am going to use that level two charges, and that becomes a standard in home, and what will happen if the distribution network supply uh, can it meet the off peak? And upgrades can be expensive, especially nowadays. Most of our urban lines are all underground. And, and naturally, upgrades of that will be very expensive. Now, there will be overload on our distribution line. Look at the overload, depending on how the overload is. This is how much the, the basic case is. With a plug-in electric vehicle, you can see the load becomes three times more. So if you are looking at 100% e-mobility scenario, instead of having that as a maximum line, of loading most of the time is all right but in this time these three that you see they are the ones which are the going to be an issue so if i can say that i can put my uh, my charge remember i told you that towards the night time this is when i can charge my electric vehicle i will not allow you to charge between 8 a.m and say 9 p.m but you can charge from 9 p.m. onward to about 7 a.m. It will also improve your load factor if the charging is managed. Look at that. How much is improvement is there for your load factor? It could improve up to about 7% of your load factor. Now, a question might come is uh, what will happen if we move completely to electric vehicles? That means 100% of our vehicles will become electric. So if you look at the scenario and look at the cost, okay, this is the scenario with uh, ICE. That means you've got your buses, your, your vehicle fuel, your EV in infrastructure, your vehicle fuel, and all those things, right? That is your structure. This is the capital of the vehicle. Uh, if you're looking at electric vehicle, the whole thing, then you will find that uh, you can do that by 2025. I think we can have 100% transition, although it may not be possible. I think more realistic to say 2030 that we will have 100% transition. So if there is 100% electric vehicle, there will be significant additional demand, but with managed charging should increase network utilization. Now, uh, I, I want to stop over there for a few minutes just to see your reactions. Um, um, is there anyone who has got any question? Anyone who has got some question over there before I, I continue? I want to give you five minutes of break so that if there's any people who want any question to what I have said up till now, Uh, yes, sir. Yes, Vinay. Vinay, you want to ask? Uh, no questions. No questions. As any, of now, any, we have not received any kind of questions, sir. 
No, but I just want to make sure that my audience is is happy about this uh, because I don't want yeah. to continue if they are not happy. Yeah. I, yes, Vinay. I, I request I request all the participants if you have any kind of questions, please post it in the chat box. Or else you can unmute and ask the question directly to Attar Kalam sir. Yes, I'd be more than happy. I'd be more than happy to try and answer your question, and um, uh, and see whether you have any. Subhashini, have you got anything? No. Vijay Kumar. If there are none, then I'll continue. Yeah, please. Is that all right, Vinay? No, no, no one, sir. Okay, okay, no problem. Yeah, yes. So, as I was saying, um, as I was saying that, um, uh, let me go back to my presentation. Can you see my slides? Um, yeah, visible, sir. Yep, good. So, um, as you can see, my friends, that that is the additional demand that I need to have. Oh, no, I do not. Now, um, uh, Vinay, could you tell me how I can? I I came to this and now I can't go back. Vinay, how do I go back? Uh, uh, just press escape, sir. Press escape. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. Now it's... Yes, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Wait, Vinay. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Our screen is visible, sir. Yep, no problem. Now let us look at um, the Australian Energy Market Commission. What they have done and looked at the response to electric vehicle. Now we're coming to interesting part of the... Up till now I was introducing to you the subject. Now we come to the nitty gritty, the challenges. And uh, the Australian Energy Market Commission uh, has said that um, this, this will be a great potential for demand response. They want that uh, the technology should be neutral and they want to see the power of choice. And they've done that. This is a very interesting one, the power of choice. And let us look at some of the uh, Australian Energy Market Commission key projects. And two of them is what I want to talk about. They've got a lot of them, okay? But in the retail market, they have two of them. And the one of them is the review of electric vehicle. Look at how they are looking at. See the electric vehicle being charged commercially or in the residential itself, or the choice of the people. And, and if you look carefully at that, they are looking at informed choices on the way electricity uh, is and the bills are managed. Okay, uh, And this is what is uh, from the Ministerial Council of Energy says that they want to give a highest priority to the power of choice. Like how do you manage the bill so that uh, people do not start asking exorbitant prices for green energy. So this is the proposal in the power of choice that the demand service providers can directly participate in the wholesale market and they will receive the spot price. They will allow consumers to engage with multiple different parties for different services and make this DSP a part of network planning, improve framework for how distribution network tariffs are determined, overreaching framework to encourage commercial investment on better meters 
but uh, this is a very interesting one we have got smart meters in our home everyone has got smart meters in australia but i think you know our smart meters have got all the capabilities but the location which has been there in our homes is such that it makes it a dumb meter so it's not a smart meter it's a dumb meter so it must be a investment we are doing we all paid 500 dollars for a smart meters and and we find that we have got smart meters but we do not have the choice of changing from one uh, uh, distribution company to another uh, because the it is it is located in such a place that we cannot go uh, or it's difficult so uh, we want to make sure that there is better metering uh, access should be there for customers and greater coordination between measures and policy for for energy efficiency and the dsp now this is an interesting one time varying network tariffs so this has to be mandated and and look at cost very very reflectively look at the peak demand periods and look at cost encourage customers to respond appropriately retailers remain free to decide how to include in retail office offers i tell you right now the the tou that you have got the time of use that you have got are the off peak and the on peak i believe that the off peak and on peak will disappear because you will be using more electricity in the off peak period you remember i told you from 9 pm to 7 am you've got your electric cars you want to charge that electric car so you will be using electricity more in the night time than in the day time so if they give it to you at a discount price which is one third the price of the on peak charges then they, they will lose money so what will happen is that this will depend on the type of usage you have so that on peak and off peak charges i believe will disappear then the next thing is um is the what are the components of electricity prices 80% of that is time varying whether it is wholesale distribution or retail okay all of them is based on time uh so you have to be very careful that uh, uh, that uh, that how you're going to it is no longer that type because um, your ev is going to be charged in the night time so they can't be giving it to you as especially discounted off peak charges so you will find that what will happen that there will be time varying network tariff that off peak and on peak will go away and you will see and i am starting with with gradual so that there is engagement with the customer and let us start with the small to medium residential and small business consumers they will be in the third band now that third band will also take vulnerable consumers and has to make sure that those consumers are protected there are a lot of people who come from the low ses <coughs> type of infrastructure they come from low ses primary income so you have to make sure that they are uh, they are taken care of so they, this this will be a tariff for for small to medium residential sector for the medium to large will be a different tariff and for the large industrial sector there will be a different tariff can you see you can opt in or, or out out depending on whether you are small to medium or medium to large but band one has to be mandatory and you will find that will be only in in large residential and small business consumers so therefore you see how the tariff will change that is how the tariff will be how the tariff will increase see it will be slow in band 3 then it will keep on gradually increasing in band 2 and become highest in band 1 okay now we go to a next topic v2g and i was asked by um, dr kulkarni to talk about vehicle to grid 
Now, can I use electric vehicle as a distributed storage? That is a, 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 a very good question. Because um, there are a large number of grid connected batteries. We are, can we use this for distributed storage? Can we integrate this with renewables? So you have to make sure that you've got distinction between managed charging, which is delay charging temporarily, and V2G, which is supply energy back to the grid. And you will find uh, this is, and I'll give you an example. In 2016 in South Australia, we had a, 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 a great uh, a windstorm and typhoon. And um, what happened was that most of our wind turbine got uprooted. And, and there was no power. And, and South Australia has got its own small power system. But they were buying power from Victoria and from Queensland. It, they found that uh, the frequency dropped substantially. And um, Victoria cut itself out from South Australia. And the, after a few minutes, Queensland did. And South Australia went in complete blackout. And Adelaide, which is the main city in, in there, was in, without power for a long period of time, I think for three days. South Australia did not have power for 10 days. So at that time, they said that we, we should have had a, a, a grid battery system, a battery connected system. And, and they built a 100 megawatt battery system uh, for, uh, as a backup. And, and they did that in three months time. It was built by, by Elon Musk of Tesla. He built it in three months. And uh, that was a record time, that 100 megawatt is, was built. Now we have got 300 megawatts in Victoria and many places as a backup, uh, especially if the renewables are, are not there and, and, and can we integrate this with renewables. And it's an ideal way of doing it. Now let us look at, um, at uh, the success of vehicle that will make our influence of vehicle to grid. Remember my friends, okay, the success will depend on the battery life. I can tell you right now, my friends, the cost of the batteries has completely gone down. The life of the battery has increased dramatically. If you look at your car, I don't know about your car, but I have got uh, two Volkswagen in my garage. And I can tell you, one is an SUV, the other is a, is a sedan. And uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, my battery will last longer than my car. And I have not changed the battery at all. So uh, you find that um, uh, I have got in my car, uh, battery warranty is, is such that uh, they're giving us 10 years warranty on the, on the battery. I, I used to think that every three years we have to change the batteries. So. Uh, I believe that the battery is going to outlast the car. So they, they're definitely going to, I think the prices have gone down dramatically and go down further. Then the concern of the driver, that means uh, how, will, how will that driver manage when the vehicle is discharged? Uh, that is one concern. If, they, if the battery is not charged, how are they going to manage that car? And, and that is one of the, that will be definitely a concern. They do not want, the driver does not want to sell everything to the grid from the vehicle, right? Because they don't want a car which is discharged car when they return back. So they have to be careful of, that will be the success which will drive your V2G. The tariffs arrangement, if you must reward with higher tariff for V2G, then consumers pay. So you have to give them better tariff, better results. And that will definitely be a, an incentive for us to be selling it back to the grid. And the critical mass of electric vehicles. Remember, electric vehicles aggregator is in fact an intermediate between the electric vehicles 
and the operator of power grid. The electric vehicles aggregator is responsible for the management of electric vehicles in order to supply the owners with their orders and also for maximizing the profits of power grid in electricity market. So that services has to be insured and that will ensure that your V2G is a success. Now look at some of the areas which is of value for <clears throat> from storage point of view. And, and I want to emphasize that the power system requires both generation and load are in balance. Because if you want your power systems to operate safely, then both your generation and load has to be in balance. If there is a variation in generation without a variation in load, then the frequency will deviate. And at extreme level, you are going to have failures and blackout. This is what happened in South Australia. That is when you will have this frequency control ancillary service, FCAS. This is the process which will come with the energy market operator will maintain the frequency of the system within the normal operating band around 50 cycles per second. So remember, if your frequency is dropping down to less than 48 hertz or less than 48.5 hertz, FCAS will come into action. So put simply, I can say that FCAS is going to provide a fast injection of energy, a fast reduction of energy. And this is the one which is going to manage your supply on demand. So the price arbitrage which is there is the difference between the peak and the off peak. And that is not very large. Okay, that's not very large. But this is going to be an important thing. But remember, as this is controlled, I told you right now, it's controlled by the market operator. For us is national electricity market. That is our operator, energy market operator. They will make sure that this operates and that is your system is under 50 hertz. Now you can defer the network augmentation, most likely area of sufficient benefit to justify cost. And this is largely unrelated to renewable integration. So if you look at comparing electric vehicle to large scale battery storage, and this is what I wanted to, uh, to emphasize. Can I, instead of having an electric vehicle, can I just have a large scale battery storage? And that's the question I want to ask because the large scale batteries will give me significant upfront cost. Naturally, it's going to cost us, a, I told you, uh, 100 megawatt, it took $300 million to construct that. That, that station in South Australia. We've got 300 megawatts in Victoria. That cost us about $600,000, $600 million. So it's, it's going to be a lot expensive. But uh, this installation is justified because of network determined. And this is minimal operating cost. Once installed, you can use it for price arbitrage and the frequency control ancillary services, as I mentioned in my previous slide. You can do that for price arbitrage and you can do that for FCAS. And remember I told you FCA is cheap because it's controlled by the energy operator. Now as far as the electric vehicle is concerned, look, I don't have that upfront cost. I don't have to spend that $300 million. You have got a car, you know, you've got this car. Uh, you can see the car that uh, uh, our bosses, Dr. Kulkarni, will have. This is Dr. Kulkarni will pay. Why should the the state pay for that? So this is minimal as far as the upfront cost is concerned. But it it is an inconvenience cost. Business case likely to be best for rare use in extreme circumstances. And and I would like to think that I will use my someone will use my electric vehicle if there's going to be shortage of, of supply because 
it's it's been a very difficult day and and the generation is not enough to meet the demand then they might have to buy power from any independent producer and dr kulkarni because he has got an electric vehicle can give us power so that is a type of example that in extreme circumstances we will use dr kulkarni's car for uh, for for running our system now ev is providing contingency for frequency control ancillary services and look at that it depends on the regulation and contingency and contingency can be 6 second contingency it could be 6 be 5 contingency look at that i can raise my i, I can raise my demand or i can lower my wind or pv generation in all these cases whether it's 6 second or 60 second or 5 minutes so ev and some other types of demands may be well suited to contingency rate services but this is rarely called upon aggregate to provide large quantity provided contingency services are expensive okay because you need to supply large reserve capacity renewables and demand manager may help reduce contingency the frequency control ancillary service so as far as the v2g option is concerned my friends as far as the v2g option is concerned we can look at v2g or i can look at v2h that means i can look at my vehicle supplying the grid my friends there is going to be technical challenges and to, for this to become feasible the tariffs has to be sufficiently high i'm not going to sell this my charged vehicle to to the grid just because the grids want it unless and until i get some incentive and as and until i get more than what the tariff is required by the grid if it is the same i will not allow my vehicle to be used to support the grid then the vehicle to home this will be more interesting because this is my home i am not exporting to the grid and is much simpler the only reason i would do that if i am on a strong tou or time of use tariffs and that means i am in a critical peak pricing the cpp is critical peak pricing which is a type of pricing which is based on tous that means the effect is with the exception of certain peak period at which time electric prices may reflect the cost of generation of per purchasing electricity at the wholesale level so if i am on a strong tou tariff okay i would like to have my vehicle i charge it in in kg it my vehicle this is illegal by the way i don't want you to do that but i just want to say that someone charges outside and use it to run it so this might provide the vast majority of benefit and it may not have a lot of hassle to and you will find more and more vehicle will be providing uh, power to home and i've seen a lot of example of a uh, number of cars which has got capability of providing uh, to the home uh, using your electric vehicle to run your home now if you look at another another way that is it would be most significant contribution if electric vehicles is in mass production of batteries so um, the simulation of technology is improvement and you can keep on reusing the battery so this will be the most important thing so uh, this question which was asked by dr kulkarni i can't say tell him right now 
that my friends, Dr. Kulkarni, the tradition, the transition to electric vehicle is inevitable, whether you like it or not. The problem is uncertainty. Now, if you want this to be successful, you have to make sure that there is incentive, whether it is your your government of your Karnataka or, or your central government, your federal government, someone has to give incentive so that uh, we can have appropriate charges. And, and naturally, it will have great impact on peak demand. But again, there will be a power of choice review. Now, vehicle to grid has a limited application, but uh, I believe that it will only be called um, when uh, when there is scarcity in the supply because the load is much or there's going to be cyclone, typhoon, and you've got your renewable energies uprooted, then and only then you may have that sort of issue. Now, um, I would like to talk about more. I mean, I haven't finished uh, the last two topics. And my last two topic is that um, uh, uh, the challenges especially the 21st century challenge. Remember, most of us are living in urbanized area and the urban population is booming. It is not the rural population. The rural population is going down and everyone wants to move to big cities. The total world population is from 7 to 9.5 billion people. Urban population is between 50 to 75 percent. In 40 to 50 years time, we will have 3 billion more people. 3 billion more people will be in the urban city. This is the type of situation you will have in Belgavi. Belgavi. This is how the congestion will be. You'll be sitting like in Thailand, in Bangkok. Okay, You'll be sitting like that. There's going to be problems. You're going to have air pollution. Climate change will come in. Health will be a huge issue. Because those who live in the urban cities use more energy per capita. 70% of total greenhouse gas emissions comes from the urban areas. more than 700 to air pollution. Remember my friends, and I will give you example of some of the cities in the world, and I will show you how bad it is. I challenge you to challenge me on this, that India is very good. You are having deaths in your country because you cannot control air pollution. And I will show you the figures. So, if you go to the e-mobility type of screen, look at my uh, thing, especially if you're looking at uh, the passenger's vehicle and, and looking at the light duty vehicle evolution, you will find that with the electricity, you will find uh, will capture the market. This is the light duty vehicle evolution. So you will find that uh, this will be the effect of electric vehicle when they're going to go on rise. And you will find that uh, we just had the climate summit in, in Glasgow. And, and you know that in, in, in COP26, when both Modi and Scott Morrison ran away from there. They did not agree to anything. And that's the type of thing because they cannot get out of the fossil fuel. There has to be a pledge between the supply and de demand side. In the supply side, the industry has to increase the global market share of EV in cities. So you must have by 2030, 30% of your should be electric vehicle. So in industry, industry renewable must take a play sustainable development with particular effort to transport and mobility. They strive to increase the global market share of electric vehicles in cities to reach 30%.
as far as the city and government are concerned, but vehicles will form 30% of the fleet of the light vehicle. So one, 30% of our vehicle should be electric by 2030. And you will have multilateral development banks, which will increase the investment to some so that they can attain the 30% goal of light duty vehicles, which will be mainly comprising of electric vehicles. Then there will be a pledge between the supply and the demand side. And the best example I can think of is Hyderabad. In Hyderabad, you have got an e-bike share system. This is a metro rail. This is a free allocation of space at metro station. You've got a Hyderabad bi bicycle club. You've got Greater Hyderabad Metro. Uh, the company is Metropolitan Agency. So you've got this. You come out of the station in Hyderabad, and this is what you see. So this is, this is a great initiative, which is in Hyderabad. Now I'd want to talk about the Australian initiative. In Australian in initiative, um, we have got new energy at the moment, which is looking at comfort, convenience, and control for the customers. And most of our customers will have smart connection. Last year, most of these connections were made. And prices are competitive and connected energy that provides company, convenience, comfort, and, comf and uh, control. So look at that. Amongst all the large ones, we already have most of them electric vehicle services. There's small commercial. And look at all the various type of things which will, be, which will be part of our system. Look at all the various things which will make our new energy. It is no longer just the uh, power embedded generation or LNG and the CNG type. But look at all the. The, the transport sector will definitely change dramatically. Now, this is what you will see. You, you will have your house, and, and you will have, uh, we, we already have this plug-in vehicle at home so that we can charge our car, OK, from there. We already have this. Then um, EV market is heading in the right direction. Look at that. This is what happened, right, in 2011. Then it went down, and everyone thought that the electricity company will go down the tube. Now, with the coming of the electric vehicle, as I was telling you, you are finding that our expectation, as the electric vehicle matures, you find that our productivity of electric vehicle makes our electricity companies viable. So. The Australian electric vehicle market will be large by 2030. Uh, and I told you, remember, the early adopters, they are the ones who are the educated toys. They are the ones who have got high earning. Their asset will go to $11 billion. Electric vehicle fleet uh, by, uh, by, by 2020 will be 36,000, and that will definitely increase. Uh, then. The asset value will go now, which is 0.5 billion dollars, to 11.3 billion dollars. The demand, electricity demand. Look at that. Today the demand is 0.17 terawatt hour. Okay, 2030 it'll increase five, not five times. It'll increase more than more than 50 times. That is how it will impact. So the the carbon abatement. Look at the carbon abatement, how much abatement that we can save. This much CO2 we can save, 6 million tons of CO2. Now, the, the outlook for Australia is such that uh, we are trying to improve. Uh, look at all the prices. I've got all the prices. Uh, as I told you, in 2016, we own 2,400 vehicles. In 2018, we have 5,600 vehicles. And I already told you that uh, we expect 30% of our vehicle uh, to be electric by 2030. So out of the 17 million vehicles, 
thirty percent will be electric. Now we are looking at go government. Government is the best place because government have got a lot of fleet, and um, uh, we the government has already started transition. They've got seven thousand five hundred people, and uh, they are now looking at at increasing it all to go with with either electric vehicles or no electric vehicles. If they go with no electric vehicle, right, uh, these will be the impact. Whereas uh, related to the business as usual, or look at the electric load. The electric load is definitely going to go up if there is high usage of electric vehicles. Now, you you will have a connected system because there will be multiple domain. I mean, that's what I I'm doing a lot of work on IOTs. Okay, looking at how the whole constraint will be there, how the system will be integrated. So there will be user, there will be transport, there will be system, there will be charging, there will be network. So the whole system will be all interconnected. And and we do have this car in in. In, in in Australia, this is from our local distribution company. Now a, a bit on India itself before I complete. This is my last part, and I want to give you some context with India and look at some of the results and some recommendation. First of all, um, uh, uh, India is committed to electrification, especially in transportation area. They're looking at clean transportation. Uh, and and they will be, they are doing that because they want energy security environment and clean air and i'll come back to that in a minute my friend um, they they you have got a, a national electrical el electricity mobility mission of 2020 when you had planned of having 6 to 7 million electric vehicles i don't know how many of them are there at the moment but that was your plan the national smart grid mission, uh, they are primary driver of grid modernization. Renewable generation has increased uh, to 175 gigawatt, six times from the current state of generation mix. Okay, and uh, your greenhouse gas emission and air quality, uh, that is a bit of a question mark because 68% of your power are still coming from fossil fuel plants. That's a big issue you have. And, and this is only to make sure that you're built in Bihar, in Jharkhand area, where all the coal mines are, which is the, um, which is the, the, the voting bank of the present government uh, remains intact. And they want to make sure, and this is the same in Australia. Uh, in Queensland, we have got all your, our, our fossil fuel plant, and um, they want to make sure that uh, they get the votes from those people. So, uh, and, and and look at this, my friend. Look at this. And 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 I'm, I'll come back to this this one in a minute. I'll come back. And I want to compare India with China. I'll compare India with China. Look at India and look at China. And I'll compare that. And and I'm going to and I'll explain what that PM two point five concentration is. Now this is what it is. In a in a in 2015 in Delhi, your uh, PM 2.5 level was 97.5 microgram per cubic meter. Okay, in 2019, instead of reducing, it has gone to 98.6. I don't know how much it is today, but I'll just tell you in a minute. But that is the graph that I had, which just talks about that instead of going down, it has actually gone up. Look at Beijing, my friend. I'm comparing Delhi with Beijing. I'm comparing apples with apples, not apples with, with mangoes. Their PM 2.5 level was 78. And they have reduced by 60%. They've gone to about 42.4. That has still come lower. See how much how they have done, and look at us, in in Melbourne, our PM two point five level was six point five microgram per cubic meter. 
And in 2018, the annual average was 5.8 microgram per meter cube. And in 2017, the annual average was 5.4 microgram per meter cube. And for your information, anything more than 60 is danger level. Look, China has already come to less than 60 microgram per meter cube. Now I want to show you your figures. Look at Delhi. This is in 2020 I'm looking at. It was 84.1 microgram per cubic meter. Uh, then I want to look at, at Tinjian was 48.9. But I want to compare Beijing. Look at Beijing. Is 37.5. You know, I mean, uh, we are way above. We are polluting. Delhi is, 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 a, is a gas chamber, my friend. Delhi is a gas chamber. So it's, a, it's a very polluted air in Delhi. I remember when I was a student in Aligarh, I used to go to Delhi very often. We used to see, see smog uh, in, in December, November time. And that was really fog and smog smog because of uh, of the weather condition. Now you see smog and fog 12 months in a year, and that is because of air pollution. It is not a cold weather. It is definitely, it is because of the industrial waste and use of fossil fuel plant. Unless and until they have dehumidifier, people in Delhi will suffocate. Now, <laughs> I want to talk about why electric vehicles are important. Because I want to focus on electric management within the context of the grid. I'm looking at the transmission and distribution and electric vehicle stakeholder systems and integration of all that. Now, this is an example that I want to give of the United States. Okay, This has an aggressive EV deployment goals. They have done that. California has done that. And they did it in 2014, my friend. They had 100,000 plug-in electric vehicle. This is how they have done that. The 2020 electric vehicles will, will cost the same as their internal combustion counterpart. So an electric vehicle in the United States will be of the same price of IC engine car. And that is the point which is going to lift off the sale. And they have done that. California is, is zero emission policy. You cannot have any emission in California. So you can see that, uh, that you have to be aggressive. If you want to have a potential and look promising, you have to be aggressive. You not only lower the number of electric vehicle charging stations per electric vehicle, but prepare them for tenfold increase by 2020. As I told you, 120,000 Californian EVs were at the end of 2015. That California itself was 40% of US electric vehicle usage. California is 40% of national source, national sales of electric vehicles. And then they did that. So this is what I call, you know, a leapfrogging, 35% of EV share, right? 10 times increase in California in five years, 40 times increase in the infrastructure. You must provide the customers with the infrastructure that they have these cars, but they must be able to charge it also. So there is a, in the 21st century, the grid must have integrated and interoperable power systems. There will be a lot of DGs. Remember, mono flow of electricity will not be there. There will be multiple flow of power, two-way flow. That is interoperability. And the network enables secure real-time communication and control of the energy sources. So you will see a new structure that is Vehicle to grid integration or smart changing, that will be the one. I would go not for V2G or V2H, I would say V2X. You can have vehicle that is powering anything. 
And that's what I'm doing nowadays with my IoT. That can face inherent problems like battery degradation and avoided manufacturer's warranty when a battery electric vehicle is used for function, which is external to driving needs. That will come. So look at that. When I look at the, this is my classical duck curve. And this is how the, the point will have. That will be when there will be lower peak. So this is your classical duck that I was talking to you about. Okay, this is my peak. That's when there's a peak generation. Okay, so you can see my various type of EV and DER management. Okay, you can see the charging systems, and this is the domain where there is the transition and distribution in behind the meter BTM. Or in the building, again, BTMs. So you will see that there will be a lot of generation and DR will be integrated. You will see huge amount of sensors, measurements, control. You'll be looking at interoperability, systems and devices. New type of tools will be coming in. You will have greater decision making and planning of the grid processes. You'll be looking at operation and market. Security, cyber security will become a huge impact. Reliability and resiliency will be there. Now, the interoperability that I talked to you about. Interoperable standards and integration solutions has the potential for EV diffusion and the lower EV or EV is electric vehicle supply equipment cost and enable the EV grid. So as EV is going to become prevalent, its flexibility will be addressing load and energy storage opportunities. So the mobile nature of electric vehicles will require a robust smart charging system because this is an opportunity that EV has. Every day, Americans spend about $1 billion in energy and $1.4 billion in gasoline. Plug-in vehicles will give utilities the opportunity to tap into latter market. Homes that have an EV will consume 58% more electricity. The Edison Electricity Institute, a power industry trade body, recently showed that a plug-in has a quadruple win for utility company. In other words, they could help the industry increase demand, meet environmental goals, get closer to customers, and cut costs by electrifying its vast vehicles. Look at that. Look at all the electric vehicles, all the interoperability. That's the work I'm doing at the present moment, Okay, looking at V2G integration. Then. Uh, if you look at uh, the 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 uh, benefits that this will provide, uh, we will we will can get the best type of software. Okay, uh, there is plans to use reaction to demand. This is what is being used. Uh, there is all sorts of uh, support which is available for day ahead and hour ahead pricing, and and they're looking at various type. This system, which is a new system, they're using that system. And, and they can curtail it. Look, that's a, that is a workplace charging. That's a smart grid. That is being used in the United States at the moment. This is used by Southern California Edison uh, properties. So they are saying that they can provide the software. They can plan the user's reaction. And they can give the support. And they, you can swipe the card and choose their product. Just swipe the card and you can use that. So that is, that is the type of system that I think more and more people will be using. Then uh, this is another case study. You will find that battery enabled DC fast charger. You remember I was talking about DC fast charger uh, where there's only 470 in Australia. This will be the V2G integration for regions where energy demand is high and power supply is limited. And you will find that uh, many companies, especially this Hawaiian electricity company, they has green lots. They have implemented it for scalable, scalable solution as one of the strategies for our autonomous operation 
for accelerating EV initiative. The charger's integrated energy storage allows it to maintain full power operation through constrained grid conditions or where there is insufficient electricity capacity. The cost of storage is equal or less than the grid upgrade deferral and congestion. And they're using that. They are using that in, high, in Hawaiian Electric Company. They have not compromised the service. They have not compromised the services. And they're using the DC fast charger. Now, uh, there, is a, the whole, there is a proof of concept. I already have that. Okay. Uh, there's innovation, looking at onboard vehicle, like telematics, etc. Uh, looking at OVGF, the OVGIP, which is open vehicle, vehicle to grid integration platform. There's demonstration, which manages uh, various OEM manufacturers. <coughs> and the second, this was the phase one that they did. Phase two, they're looking at the prototype. <coughs> Now, um, after that, um, uh, the vehicle to grid integration, especially for India, I want to mention this, uh, that um, smart charging, um, BEV technology, battery electric vehicle technology, will be using the unidirectional control ch challenging system. And the power system, which can be integrated, can provide market-based dispatchable grid resources for variable generation. Interoperability and cybersecurity lowers the barriers for, uh, for vehicle-to-grid integration, whether there is V1G, which is unidirectional control charging system, or V2G, okay, and accelerate that ex elect electricity mobility. So you will find that uh, the road mo motor vehicle adoption rate per capita is still one of the lowest in the world. In, in India, there is a history that you leapfrog innovation. Telecom did that, internet did that. I think EM, electric mobility policies can support sustainable government, uh, sustainable growth and new economy. Urban cities with air quality can be frontline for two or three and four vehicle EV adoption, including electrification of public transportation. So look at that. You see, there must be the national mission must consider technical and regulatory challenges. And you must look at actual case studies, not just uh, some, some plot that you have made, actual case studies. And you have to design policies that will leapfrog your EV ownership. And I know in India you can do it. The vehicle to grid integration lesson can serve as a model for India, and that will accelerate the adoption of EVs, decarbonize electric grid, and improve urban quality. Inter and intra ministry coordination is required. The Ministry of uh, HI and the Ministry of Planning, the Ministry of new and renewable energy, all of that has to coordinate. At the moment, MOHI does not know what MOP is doing and what MNR is he doing. So there has to be, they have to execute the integrated clean energy and clean transportation growth. And all these three ministries within the present government has to work in coordination. There has to be a complete coordination between the three ministries. So uh, I think that is a fantastic example in Hyderabad. I give great congratulations to the Indi India's e EV industry for coming up with that wonderful scheme. And I was very impressed when I visited Hyderabad. With that, I have finished my presentation. Thank you very much, and a happy new year to everyone. Thank you, Any sir, questions? for the very informative session. Now, I request all the participants to fill the feedback form. Uh, sir, your session was very informative, covered all the aspects of EV. Sir, I have one question, sir. Is a vehicle to be yes, feasible, sir? Yes, sir. I, I, can, I can see you, Rudresh. Tell me, what is it? Sir, is vehicle to grid is feasible? 
I, that the whole my presentation was that vehicle to grid uh, technically is feasible. Is it useful? That is the question you want to ask. I presume is that the question? I, I don't think that for the uh, for the normal purpose you will be using vehicle to grid. But when a calamity occurs, when there is a typhoon in 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 uh, in Belagravi or wherever you are, right? you are going to look at a situation that you may not have enough generation to supply the demand. What will you do? You have to pump. They will have to buy. They will have to buy it from independent producers. Independent producers will not have enough. So Rudresh, if you had electric vehicle, you will sell your, your, your power to the grid. But the only way you will sell it to the ratio, and I want to make sure that you understand this, the only way you will sell, if the tariff is good, if the tariff is hopeless, you will not sell it. Why should you sell it? You are not Father Christmas. Do you understand, Udresh? So it is yes, possible, it is technically feasible, but it will not be used at all times. This is my opinion. Is that clear to you, Rudresh? Yes, sir. Thank sir, you very are, much. Very good. sir, are electrical cars are really more environmental friendly than the gas powered vehicles? My friend, first of all, let me clarify one thing for you. Yes, sir. Gas is more poisonous than, than coal fired plant. You'd be surprised to hear this, but let me tell you. The nitrous oxide just comes in is more dangerous than the CO2 emission. So that is one problem you have. So number one, in electric vehicle emission is zero or practically zero. Here you have got, although the percentage of emission from gas fuel uh, vehicle is less the NGV, which is the LPG or LNG, whatever you use in India, I don't remember. But um, whatever you use over there, Rudresh, they're not a good thing. As a matter of fact, it is bad. It is bad for the environment. That's why in the COP26, they were not talking about CO2 emission. They were talking about NH4 emission to go down, methane emission to go down. Because ultimately, the CO2 and the nitrous oxide, which comes from the gas, that has to go down too. Is that clear, Rudresh? Yes, sir. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other very good question, Rudresh? Yes, Vinay. Sir, is there any kind of research work uh, going at your place, your university, regarding EVs? Um, I I must tell you one thing, uh, Vinay is that um, uh, there is no problem coming to my university or working with me. I've got no issues at all. Uh, but you understand that um, uh, if you are asking whether I can provide you with scholarship or not, you have to apply. With the pandemic, I tell you one thing. With the pandemic in the last two years, we could not afford to pay the scholarship. We, sorry, we did not offer new scholarship to students uh, in the last two years purely because we lost uh, most of our income. It was difficult for us to survive. The pandemic did have, you must understand, Australia is a very big in selling education. In Victoria, we have got $14 billion business is education. And, and therefore, uh, at the moment, uh, the scholarship chances are pretty minimal in my university you I, if you talk about other universities it might not be true they might have a lot of opportunities and you can apply to any place you want it that is one way the second way is to do research if you're already working in in um, a G, gkit or wherever you're working my friends i can tell you one thing and that is um uh, vinay is that um, you can always come on a on a, on a staff exchange program. You can always come and work with us. 
even by not coming, by connecting to us through internet. And nowadays, the whole uh, WhatsApp and 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 internet and uh, so many things of so many Twitters, Facebook. People are asking about LinkedIn. I'm already there in the LinkedIn. Uh, I've got more than 1,500 followers in LinkedIn. But uh, you understand, I'm an old man, number one. Number two, I don't have enough time. Uh, it's becoming 11 o'clock in the night at the moment, and um, uh, I'm still working. So I started my day at 7 a.m. To today. Uh, and I'm not young anymore, Vinay. I'm not like you. I can see you've got wonderful, handsome features. And uh, I envy you. And I, I want that you should enjoy yourself, Vinay. Yeah, I can see that, Vinay. Yeah. You, your, your picture in, in, in person is much better than the picture in the in that uh, uh, the, the still picture. Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome, Vinay. Any other question? Rudresh, you are much more handsome, too. <laughs> I Thank forgot you, to mention that. Dr. Mehta asked um, about uh, link, LinkedIn. Yes, I am in LinkedIn, uh, but you can always send me an email. Um, I can tell you, um, Dr. Kulkarni knows all my email address, etc. Um, you can contact me on WhatsApp. Uh, my problem is that um, I get more than 200 emails a day. Uh, Dr. Mehta, sometimes I can be delayed in answering your emails, but I do look at LinkedIn, but I look at LinkedIn at after hours only, and sometimes uh, I get very tired in the evening. So so that is that is my situation, but uh, please feel free to contact. I mean, uh, there's no there's no way, it doesn't cost you anything these days. Uh, Gopala has raised his hand. Gopala, what, how can I do? What can I do for you, Gopala? Gopala, are you there? Any questions? So Gopala has raised his hand. I don't know what he wants to ask. Oh, 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 oh. No, no, no. Any other questions, please? Vinay, any other question? Uh, yeah, dear participants, any other questions? For Atar Kalam, sir. Look, uh, I, 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 just, uh, yes, I wanted sir. to say that I just finished one semester of teaching at VIT Chennai. I just uh, gave one one whole semester of of lectures on on renewable energy, and so I I did that um, religiously for two days a week. It was very difficult. Uh, to do that, but uh, I did that, and so whenever there's an opportunity, let us know if I can, if I can be of any help to GKIT, I'd be more than happy. Yeah, sure, sir, sure. You'll be pleased. Uh, I, I I I did that last last semester at VIT Chennai. Before that, I did it in in Punjab Technical University. So whenever you need, and I come to India. I haven't been to India in the last two years, but I do come to India two or three times a year. I live in Calcutta for those of you who do not know me. And sorry, my parents were from Calcutta. Now there is no one over there, but I do go there. Yes, sir. Dr. Mehta, you wanted to ask some question, Dr. Mehta? No. Okay, I've crossed my time, Vinay. Can I be excused, or you still want me to continue? Sir, uh, Kulkarni sir gone to meeting, sir. So they will contact you through ma email, sir. So what do you want me to do? Should I stop or should I go? Should I stop? Yeah, uh, Soumya. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, gratitude is one of the least articulate of the emotions, especially when it is deep. Being part of this workshop is really like being part of a really big family. Today, it's been my privilege to have been asked to propose vote of thanks on this occasion. I, on behalf of EEE department and the entire fraternity of the college, first of all, would like to extend my very hearty 
vote of thanks to the chief guest who spared time from his busy schedule to grace the occasion thank you sir for bestowing us with your presence i thank all the speakers for gracing your crucial time and sharing with us your opinion and finding with finding this present time i am grateful to professor db kulkarni for giving us an opportunity to organize this event heartfelt thanks goes to all the faculties who who are always ready to guide us lead us and motivate us last but not the least i thank all the students for participants and showing their interest in this program once again thank you one and all thank you sir thank you uh, thank you salam sir again and happy new year to everyone naya saal mubarak ho and naya saal ka shubhkamnaye and i don't know any other language except hindi urdu and uh, english so um uh, if if you knew tamil i would have said um uh, uh, some language in tamil a bit i i do because i go to chennai so often um but uh, uh, nandri is what they say at the end thank you very much and a happy new year to all of you wish you the same bye 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 thank you sir namaskar Hello, sir. Hello, sir.